Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. It is July 19th, 2013. Now, we have some very important information for you today. We have a revisit of the Boston bombing. This is going to be some very hard-hitting information. So if you're confused about the Boston bombing, if you don't know all the details, well, I can't go over all the details in the time I have, but the best I can into the abilities of myself and the crew, we'll give you a nice, thorough breakdown so you can see the falsification that is going on in this scandal. So let's go straight to it. Top story headline, Joe Carzarnay of throat wound. Another government lie bites the dust. This is by Kurt Nimmo. Back in April, federal officialdom told us that Boston bombing suspect Joe Carzarnayev was shot and unable to speak in the throat. Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick says Arnaif was in serious but stable condition and not able to communicate as of yet. Now you can see the picture of the younger brother right there. And you can see clearly this man does not appear to be bleeding from the throat as he has no blood trickling down the front of his shirt. You would think he would be gushing blood from that uh, particular area of his body, but he definitely is not. Now this article, or should I say this image, was released by one uh, a officer, Sergeant Sean Murphy of the Massachusetts State Police, and he says he didn't like the way that uh, Zokar was viewed or displayed on the Rolling Stones magazine. As some of you guys have probably seen that cover by now, and what to me looks like a Facebook picture, but you know, maybe somebody thought it was a glorification of him. So he released this image, and now he's under uh, investigation, that particular officer, for releasing the image that you see right there on your screen. And it just goes to show there's a lot of things, a lot of iffy things about this whole case. You know, uh, the younger brother recently appeared in court. People said he didn't seem like himself. He didn't even sound the same. Arnaev walked into the courthouse wearing an orange prison suit. He has big bushy hair. It doesn't look like he's cut it since April. He stood tall at the defense table, and on several occasions, after a handful of the counts were read, he leaned forward to the microphone, at times very close, and with a thick Russian accent said, not guilty. Uh, give me a kiss. No, give me a kiss. Adam girl. Now get out. No girl. Okay, okay, come here. Give me another kiss. Okay. He leaned forward to the microphone, at times very close, and with a thick Russian accent said, not guilty. Okay, okay, come here. Give me another kiss. And with a thick Russian accent said, not guilty. Okay, so you saw the clip right there. That was the younger brother, uh, his court appearance. You heard the... Uh, the anchor or the reporter right there saying that he leaned into the microphone and spoke with a thick Russian accent and you saw right there maybe you heard what you may be able to consider an accent it definitely didn't seem thick or Russian to me but you know to each his own and not only did he not sound the same he didn't even look the same he had a cast on his left hand uh, his face looked a, a little disfigured uh, almost swollen uh, not sure how, how to really characterize it but it, it did look like he had some impact on his face um, it was it was hard for me to believe that he was he was sitting down there. Uh, it wasn't the same guy. He was a changed person, I guess. It wasn't the same guy. He was a changed person, I guess. What did you? The way he looked, the way he kept moving his body, his posture, and all that. So you see it right there. The witnesses they say you know it wasn't the same guy, and maybe they're speculating. You know maybe he wasn't himself. Maybe he doesn't normally act like that. But you know we've heard the reports that you know he didn't cut his hair. He didn't seem to be like himself. It's a very strange situation. And somebody may point out that you know the family was there and they didn't say anything. Well, we see the family such as uh, Uncle Ruslan who has ties to the CIA, the older brother who has ties to the CIA, which we'll talk about in one moment. Uh, the aunt who was on our show, and we'll talk about her in one moment as well. Uh, she said, you know, she had been threatened, basically, uh, not to come on our show after she had talked to David Knight and also Alex Jones. So, you know, that may be a reason for them to remain silent in these very trying times. And also, I want to just hit a few bullet points before we move on. Keep in mind, with the Boston bombing, we have no surveillance footage of the brothers actually placing the bomb. Uh, the uncle has ties to the CIA as well as the, uh, the older brother. Uh, they didn't rob the 7-Eleven. We'll talk about that. And also, the police officer who was shot, there's really no evidence linking the uh, the shooting of the officer the MIT officer to the Boston brothers other than the fact that they were on a alleged crime spree at the time but other than that there's no evidence linking them to that now let's move on to a point I was making earlier Tamlin Tamerlan's Arnaev attended CIA sponsored workshops now this is the older brother you can see him right there and we'll take a look at the first paragraph here Tamlin's Arnaev attended a workshop sponsored by CIA linked Jamestown Foundation now uh, myself and David Knight had a chance to speak to uh, 
FBI whistleblower Seabell Edmonds, and she told us, you know, they like these young college guys who can speak multiple languages, and these are the kind of guys that they like to recruit into the feds. So anybody who would ask, you know, how are these guys going to recruit to the CIA, that's a reason how right there. And also, I'll we'll look at some more things here. So we see the older brother. He's a, you know, strong, athletic guy. You know, he could allegedly be the naked man. We'll talk about that in just one second. But first, let's go and listen to this interview David Knight did with the aunt of the suspect, IDing the older brother as the naked man and also saying that her nephews have been set up. Uh, hello, is this Merit Zarnev? Yes, speaking. Hi, my name is David Knight. I'm with Infowars.com. Uh, it's Alex Jones's operation. Have you heard of us? Yes, I've heard of you. Sir. And we would very much like to do an interview with you. Would that be possible? Since since I have seen the material that you presented for the public before about the invasive bombing, even before the names of our boys were put out there, I was following you, you know, from the very beginning. Okay. I don't know. I have trust in that information. I have trust in you, and I would I would like I would like to have my word said good good especially in the part when the the guy that is that was uh, taken into custody by police then uh, given over to fbi you know who i'm talking about that, yes. that clip yes yes a naked guy yes i have to i have to publicly state that i confirm and identify this person as my nephew, Tamerlan Sarnaev. She's obviously a woman in grief. Uh, she said that uh, she believes that there's a cover-up, that they were set up, but that she has basically run her race, that, 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 that she's not going to fight this anymore. Uh, and I said, is it, is it because of the threats? And she said, no, I have not been threatened. Uh, and if they're listening right now, uh, I'm not going to do anymore. So this is like something out of a movie, and of course, Earlier in the day, she had said that she was being threatened, and that was quoted by newspapers uh, around the world. Okay, so we see it right there. And you heard in that video her children playing in the background. So, of course, somebody who's being threatened doesn't, you know, want to put their children at risk. And we'll talk about what she said a little bit later in the broadcast, talking about how she trusted InfoWars because we actually put out accurate information the best we can. You know, we don't get everything right all the time, but that is our, our mission. So we'll talk about that just a little bit later. But now I want to talk about the conflicting information about the Boston bombing early on, and Leanne McAdoo has that report. I'm Leanne McAdoo, and this is an InfoWars News Bulletin. Liberty was also attacked in Boston last week in an alarming scene that was scarier than the bombing event itself. Forced lockdown of an entire city, military tanks riding through the streets, Warrantless door-to-door -door searches by 1,500 militarized police forcing families out of their homes at gunpoint. What may look like a scene from the latest big-budget Hollywood movie was actually America's first taste of martial law following the Boston bombing. Ron Paul called the scene deeply disturbing in a recent interview. Those pictures really concern me. That is such a visual image when you see thousands and thousands of troops, and they weren't your local friendly policemen that were involved. I mean, can you imagine all these people being locked? They became prisoners. It was uh, accepted too easily. It was uh, martial law. Even gun-grabbing liberal Bill Maher sees the writing on the wall. Show some of the pictures of the Boston police, okay? Look at this. I mean, if, if this is what you have, why don't you invade a country? <laughs> Show some of the other ones. I mean, go up to Canada, take their oil. Uh, <laughs> look at these, these are half tracks. These, I don't care what you, you might want to call it an urban assault vehicle, but w this country is becoming a police state and it is very troubling to me. The excuse for the complete military takeover of Watertown, Massachusetts was the manhunt for a 19 year old accused of committing a horrific crime. What normally would have been a police investigation quickly turned into the complete military occupation of an American city, conditioning us to believe that it's the government's job to keep us safe, even on the local level. We have been conditioned probably for 30 or 40 years, and you hear it all the time from the president. Their job is to make us safe. Governments aren't supposed to do that. Governments are supposed to protect our liberties. Once they decide they're going to make us safe, economically and physically safe, uh, they can only do this by taking away our liberties, and that's where we are. We seek safety 
rather than liberty. The media praised the surveillance state as triumphant in catching the suspects, with some members of Congress promptly calling for even more government cameras. The sad fact, though, is that for all of the high-tech police state efforts applied, including adding one of the suspects to an FBI and CIA watch list after receiving intelligence from both Russia and Saudi Arabia, these efforts did absolutely nothing to catch the perpetrators. It was only after the shelter-in-place order was lifted that a private citizen was able to find the suspect hiding in his boat. Footage willingly submitted by private citizens near the finish line at the time of the bombing helped police identify the suspects. And it was, in fact, the surveillance footage of a private business that allegedly caught the suspects on camera. Now, I get it. We were attacked. And I'm sure somewhere in our collective psyche, we needed that brute show of force to feel protected. But the last time Big Daddy Gov promised to protect us from the bad guys, our country went to war for more than a decade. Now our new daddy is promising to protect us from lone wolves here on American soil, and I've got a hunch about how that war is gonna be waged. But don't worry, Homeland Security only needed 750 million bullets for target practice. To see the progression of the police state, pick up copies of the Police State Trilogy and Police State 4, The Rise of FEMA at InfoWarsShop.com. I'm Leanne McAdoo, and this has been an InfoWars News Bulletin. So you heard it right there in that, in that special report from Leanne. A lot of inconsistencies even early on, and they do continue. Let's go to this. Boston terror narrative starting to fall apart. This by Zero Hedge. Now, we'll scroll down a little bit. Initially, the claim was that they robbed a 7-Eleven was totally false, as reported by USA Today on April 19th. There was a 7-Eleven robbery in Cambridge last night, but it had nothing, nothing, nothing to do with the Boston Marathon bombing suspects. We'll scroll down a little bit more. The FBI admitted Friday that they interviewed the now-deceased Boston bombing suspect Tamlin Zarnayev two years ago, and they failed to find any incriminating evidence. And we'll move down just a little bit further to the other oddities section. According to the head cross-country coach of the University of Mobile, bomb-sniffing dogs in a bomb squad inspected the runners. So, you know, you got a guy saying, a very credible man, I assume he's been to one or two of these things before, the, uh, the track coach. And he says, you know, there were bomb sniffing dogs around, you know, even though the FBI and other people have tried to deny that that went on. Dan Badandi uh, went up to the area and found people who said similar things. And also uh, the FBI, keep in mind when they released the, the footage of the two brothers early on, not placing a bomb, of course, they released footage of these people. We have no idea who they are. We need you to help help us identify these guys, you know. And of course, you know, it may be hard for an officer or an agent to recall every single person they've ever come in contact with. But I would think when you say, hey, FBI, these are the guys who are these suspects, you think somebody may go dig through a case file and say, oh, yeah, that's Tamlin. Or I know that guy. I've talked to that guy's mom or so forth. But, you know, that's not, of course, what they did. And also the 7-Eleven had nothing to do with the Boston bombing suspects. It's an unfortunate situation. But, yes, it had nothing to do with the Boston bombing suspects. So those are just a few more of the inconsistencies. Now I want to go to this, Boston bombers during shootout, we didn't do it. Now if we can just play that in the background for our viewers, and I just want people to see this firefight that's taking place, you can see it right there, and I'm going to read some of the, some of the things said by the Boston bombers. At 24 seconds they said, chill out, chill out, chill out, we didn't do it, we didn't do it, we didn't do it, hey officer. Now these guys wouldn't be the first guys to claim that you know they were innocent of you know, per, you know perpetrating any particular crime, there are plenty of people in prison who say the same things. So you'd say, well, why would you say this about these particular gentlemen if they're saying that they didn't commit the crime? Well, let's go to this, our next article. Eyewitnesses, Jokar Zarnayev did not shoot Boston cop. So we'll scroll down just a little bit. Well, actually, it's the, uh, the first paragraph there. Eyewitnesses to the shootout involving the alleged Boston bombers have thrown up another contradiction to the official narrative, asserting that transit police officer Richard H. Donahue Jr. was not shot by Jokar Zarnayev, but by other cops in a friendly fire incident. Now we'll scroll down just a little bit, and it says eyewitnesses to the shootout also contradicted claims by police that Jokar Zarnayev ran over his own brother, stating and said that he was run over by police. Now you can't take an eyewitness's claim for it, I guess uh, is the case. And the article points out at the bottom that friendly fire incidents or, you know, just wrongful shooting incidents are not highly uncommon as it talks about uh, things such as the 
Empire State shooting that left many people injured who were not the intended target. So it's nothing that's uh, highly unlikely for a police officer to miss his target, especially in a pressure situation. Now, I want to go on to this, and we're going to talk about here the people who are either dead or in jail from these, uh, from these Boston bombing investigations. We'll start with this one. FBI blocks release of autopsy on Boston suspect's pal. Although the autopsy on Tochev was completed July 8th and ready for release, the FBI has informed the office that the case is still under active investigation and thus not uh, to release the document. So you remember the gentleman right there. He was a, uh, a fighter, an MMA fighter, a boxer, and so forth. And, you know, he comes in contact, or should I say the FBI comes in contact with him and another gentleman. They send, send him down. They say, hey, we got to talk about these, uh, these Boston bombing suspects. They say, okay. And then they tell one of the guys to leave, one of the, the uh, interviewees to leave. And, and uh, Chochev, he said, hey, man, I don't feel comfortable being left alone with these guys. I think they're up to something. And, you know, and the guy is being told to get out by the feds. You know, he really doesn't know what else to do but to get out. So anyway, uh, Mr. Chochev is left alone with the FBI agents. And then the story came out that he lunged at the FBI agents with a knife. Then he had a stick. Then he threw some pixie dust at him. And, but regardless, it, it ended up he really didn't have anything in his hands, and it really can't be proved that he lunged or attacked these, uh, these agents at all. But yet he's dead, and, you know, the world moves on. Nobody cares about this man is dead without any real information that he committed any type of crime. You know, he just happened to be associated to the, uh, the Boston bombers, the alleged Boston bombers. Let me emphasize that. You know, I don't convict in public opinion like many other news agencies do. And don't forget uh, the two, two accomplices or the alleged accomplices of the younger brother or the, uh, the multiple accomplices, I should say, of the younger brother who ended up in jail over the, a similar incident. Now, let's go to this. The feds just aren't satisfied with killing other people. You know, they just may happen to end up dead themselves. Two FBI agents involved in Joe Carr's Arnaeus arrest fall out of helicopter and die. Two members of the FBI's elite counterterrorism unit died Friday while practicing how to quickly drop from a helicopter to a ship using a rope. Skip down a little bit. Last month, the team was involved in the arrest of Joe Carr's Arnaeus, a suspect in the Boston Marathon bombing. Now, this reminds me of what happened to one Mr. Terrence Yankee, a Yankee in Oklahoma City. He was a first responder. Maybe he saw some things that he wasn't supposed to see. So he drove out to the sticks, slid his wrist, being, a, uh, being anemic, walked a couple miles, hopped over a fence, and then shot himself in the head at a very unusual angle. And I see the same thing with these gentlemen. I had accidents do happen. Now, of course, those things do happen. But uh, these, these FBI agents end up dead. So it's a very unfortunate situation. Now we'll jump to that. That's on your screen right there. We'll talk about the attacks on Alex Jones, and this one is by Salon. Conspiracy theories. Joe Carr was framed. Now we'll go to the first paragraph to the lower half. Conspiracy theories pushed by conspiracy broadcaster Alex Jones and others who think Zarnayev is a patsy to cover up the fact that the real masterminds of the bombings was the U.S. government. Now I'm not pointing any fingers at any one particular person, but I do think it's very suspicious that the uh, that bomb drills happened that same day as the Boston bombing. You have bomb sniffing dogs who, for some reason, can't smell a, a bomb that's right over there. Very fishy to me. And also, you know, FBI agents are ending up dead. You're, they're refusing to release uh, footage of them placing the bomb, refusing to uh, release the autopsy uh, documents about Mr. Tochev. But you know, you know, you're crazy if you dare look at people who have committed such atrocities such as the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. You can go look that up for yourself. That was in the New York Times that the, uh, the Patsy was told to make a real bomb by the FBI that then detonated. Let's move to this. Alex Jones downplays, downplays connection to Boston bomber. He could be a listener, said Alex Jones, and you know, just like the aunt said, yes, they do like to watch the show, listen to the show. We'll scroll down a little bit. Jones said the bombing was one of a number of plots hatched by the FBI, like I just said, the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. He also claimed that Joe Carr's Arnaev's throat wound would have been inflicted by the authorities, calling it that special throat surgery they did. So they don't like uh, when you point out the obvious that this man did. You know, he climbs out the boat without a gun. They don't find a go gun in the boat, even though they originally claimed that uh, Mr. Arnaev had shot himself in the throat somehow, even though he climbs out with a clean T-shirt. Uh, doesn't make any sense to me. And we'll move on to this. Police believes Arnea Brothers killed Officer for his gun. Police now think they have the answer. Investigators now believe that Officer Collier was killed because the two Boston bombing suspects wanted to take his gun. Officer Sean Collier was shot in the head execution style while sitting in his patrol car, his patrol unit. 
And this article does not point out any incriminating evidence that actually points to the two alleged bombers. It just points out the simple fact that Mr. Uh, Mr. Collier was shot in the back of the head during the alleged crime spree of the two uh, perpetrators. And that section right there is just some of the inconsistencies and the things wrong with the official story. You know, people want to believe the official story as their bread and butter, but you're taking it from an agency such as the FBI who does things such as the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Can't stress that enough because it shows that these people are not without fault. They're not without blood on their hands, not without sins in their, uh, in their stable. Johnny Appleseed was born during the Revolutionary War. He's not just a legend. And in more than five states, he introduced apples that had not even been grown in the colonies. Later, the seeds from plants he planted and cultivated and some of the varieties he developed spread across the United States. And it was Johnny Appleseed teaching the colonists and then the new Americans after we won independence the love of planting fruit trees that introduced that idea to North America. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a revolutionary act to unplug from the television, to unplug from the computer and all the globalist propaganda and to go out in your backyard or your front yard or planters at your apartment or on the roof of the building where you live and to plant a garden. Become the Johnny Appleseed of your community with seeds from the InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsStore.com. The simple act of planting fruits and vegetables and then tending them and taking care of them and then sharing them with friends and family is a revolutionary act against tyranny. The globalists, first and foremost, do not want us to be self-sufficient. The crony anti-free market capitalist, the fascist, are using socialism and collectivism to shut down societies. Stalin in Poland and in Ukraine and other areas starved on record more than 10 million people over five years by not letting them grow their own crops and collectivizing them. Mao killed between 65 million and 80 plus million people doing this same thing. The UN says they will use food as a weapon. They use genetic evil to attack the earth and major GMO companies have been caught going into growth belts around the world, even where GMO is illegal, and planting seeds everywhere to infect the genetics of the original crops. Almost all of the thousands of varieties of Mexican corn has been infected. They are in a genetic war against everyone. That's why we have to get these seeds and not just plant them on our own gardens and not just give them as gifts to friends and family to plant spring and summer and fall gardens. I'm calling on you to go out into the green belts, to go out into the areas and plant secret gardens. No, not of marijuana, but of the hundreds and hundreds of incredible high quality uh, vegetables and herbs and fruit plants that are here. Lemons and oranges, the list goes on and on. They will grow uh, plum trees, grape trees. They will grow almost everywhere in the U.S. We can literally, not just buy in these products from InfoWarsStore.com, but from wherever you get them. This aggressive program literally just came to me one morning when I woke up about 4 a.m. realizing that we've got to counter their genetic war against us with original real crops developed over eons on this planet. We have the lowest prices. We bought it in the biggest bulk that some of these companies have ever seen to ship this directly to you from the InfoWars Command Center. We stand for life. We stand for liberty. We stand for self-sufficiency. Go to InfoWarsStore.com, click on the Seed Center, and as of taping this, we have the seven top respected brands. We intend to continue to do research and find other companies, other specialties, other varieties to really take action. The InfoWars Store Seed Center has the largest online selection of heirloom, non-GMO seeds. Check out these products from our newest supplier, Heirloom Organics. The Medicine Garden for a natural remedy. The Tea Garden that contains every important tea herb you can grow. Fruit lovers with 12 varieties. And the Tobacco Pack, additive and pesticide free. Join the gardening revolution today at InfoWarsStore.com. This is a revolutionary action we're asking you to take. Plant seeds everywhere today. Nurture them, bring them to fruit, and pass on the knowledge to others. Become human again. Discover your roots. 
in the soil. And remember, the revolution against tyranny is growing. Oh, my God.